lovely lunch. I think we'll all agree that was rather good. Um, thank you all for coming to attend our session today. Um, the title for the session is A Solution for Inflation of Indwelling Catheter Balloons, A New Innovation to Improve Patient Safety. My name is Jane Graham and I'm the Senior New Product Development Specialist with Clinimed Limited. And I'll be doing this talk alongside Sharon Holroyd, who is on stage with me, and she is the Lead Continence Nurse Specialist at Calderdale Bladder and Bowel Service. Our talk today will take the format of two parts. I will take you through information regarding the innovation, and then I will pass you over to Sharon, and she will look at the, um, it, the experience in practice, including the patient's perspective, and then we will look at whether it has improved patient safety. So for part one, this is the agenda that I will be taking you through. We're going to look briefly at catheterisation. We're then going to look at problems with catheterisation and crustacean. <coughs> We're going to explore what is current, how we currently manage those situations. We're going to look at the product itself, Farco Fill Protect, and what it is. And then we're going to move on to evidence-based information on Farco Fill Protect. So catheterisation. What an indwelling catheter, as most of you fully are aware, is a catheter that's left in the bladder. It's also called a Foley catheter. And this type of catheter can be used for short, medium and long periods of time. And there are two types of indwelling catheterisation, urethral and suprapubic. Now we know and we hear and we recognise the fact that we're not supposed to be using catheters as we know what a risk of infection they are. But there are certain circumstances, obviously, that we need the use of these catheters. And we know it's estimated that 450,000 people in the UK at any one point will use long-term urinary catheters. 3% of people living in the community have a long-term catheter and 13% in care homes. Back in 2015, almost 1.2 million catheters were dispensed in the community. But with the use of catheters, there are obviously problems. There is bacterial colonisation and bacteriorrhea. Residual urine obviously provides massive conditions for the development of bacteriorrhea. Bacteria can easily enter the bladder through the catheter insertion site. Even in patients that have short-term catheterisation, and that is up to seven days, 10 to 20 percent of those will develop bacteria. Once a catheter has been in place for four weeks, without doubt that catheter at the urine, sorry, will be highly contaminated in all patients. And as you can see from the picture, the reason being is the way that the catheter is placed in the bladder with continual drainage that we always end up with a sump of residual urine. And obviously that is ideal conditions for bacteria to cause, to form, sorry. In the absence of symptoms and um, antibiotics should not and hopefully are not given, so they asymptomatic bacteria. Contaminated urine can indeed in some patients throw for, flow through a catheter for up to the maximum time, which in this country is 12 weeks. What we do know though that eventually bacteria will start adhering to the surface of the catheter, creating what we know is a biofilm. So what is a biofilm? Well, a biofilm is a group of bacteria in which the cells stick to each other, and often these cells adhere to a surface. The easiest way that I describe a biofilm is if you've maybe been out for maybe a night out and you've had a few drinks and maybe gone for a curry afterwards, and you've gone back home and possibly forgotten to brush your teeth because you've had one too many, if you wake up in the morning, that film on your teeth is a biofilm. <laughs> You're all going, oh yeah. <laughs> in patients undergoing short-term catheterisation, as I said, that's up to seven days, biofilms will still form on that catheter, but they are sparse and they will be patchy in nature and really um, of little concern to that patient at all. But in long-term catheterisation, the biofilms become extensive and they have a profound on the, f on the health and well-being of that patient. The most troublesome are what we are known as the crystalline biofilms, and these encrust and obstruct the catheter lumen. They develop rapidly and block the flow of urine. 
So if we take a look at this simple diagram to see how a biofilm sorry, causes catheterine crustacean, urine is normally slightly acidic, then becomes infected with urease produces. Urease splits urea to release ammonia. The urine then becomes alkaline. Struvite and calcium phosphates will therefore precipitate and encrustation and blockage will occur. So the problem really stems from urease producing bacteria. So which, cath which, sorry, which bacteria cause encrustation? Well, we know from lots and lots of clinical research that's gone on over the years, by, the most, by far the most problematic of those is Proteus mirabilis. The other two do cause um, catheter encrustation, but these are much less incidences. In fact, they only account for around about 8% of catheter encrustation. Proteus mirabilis is part of the normal flora in anybody's human gastrointestinal tract. But what it does, it produces a potent urease, so a potent enzyme. And it's a real fast mover. You can be able to go on YouTube and you can actually see, see um, these things growing. So it's quite fascinating. But it really grows quickly and it is a mover and a shaker, as we say. So it moves rapidly up the catheter. But it also has the ability for other bacteria to piggyback on the, on the back of it, so therefore move themselves as well. So as I say, it's able to migrate over basic types of catheter, and it moves more effectively than any other urinary tract pathogen. So it's quite a problem causer. <laughs> so where does the blockage occur? Well, you can see from the top picture, quite commonly we will see blockage and encrustation or encrustation on the catheter eyes and the tip. We will see it on the, on the surface of the catheter balloon. And quite some, often, sometimes I've been talking to some of you here, you can even see it when you take the catheters out of the, um, the patients. You can actually see the crystalline biofilm. And it also will occur in the lumen of the catheter. What we do know is that all catheters are vulnerable to encrustation. But we have found that silicon catheters actually do take a little bit longer to block. But we're not sure whether this down, down to the fact what, whether they've got, they've got a wider drainage lumen than a, a coated catheter, just because of the way they're made. Or is it because it's all silicon and they, the bacteria can't grab, on, grab hold quite as easily? We're not sure at this stage, but I think somewhere out there in the university, somebody's probably taking a look at this. This picture here is encrustation on a silver, silver catheter that was removed from a patient on just day 11. So you can imagine the, the pain that that causes when you're going to take this sort of catheter out of a patient as it's pulled through the urethra. If, if this goes unchecked, we know that there's serious issues and with problems and complications for the patient. Kidney and bladder stones can occur. Here we're looking at a bladder stone with actually Proteus mirabilis swarming round on it. The one on the left, you can see the bladder stone, hopefully, sort of. And the one on the right is just a magnif magnification of that. Also, other issues can occur, which is um, kidney infection, septicemia, which I believe we're going to hear more about later with sepsis being such a problem, and endotoxic shock, which is caused by toxins produced by the bacteria. This is obviously a massive problem to the NHS. And we know that up to 50% of long-term um, long catheterisation, uh, sorry, we know that up to 50% of long-term catheterised patients will experience catheter blockage due to encrustation. 39% of patients with a blocked catheter, and this is quite significant, they will require treatment in a hospital setting. And more shock, more, you know, this is even more shocking. Unplanned hospital admissions for blocked catheters cost the NHS approximately £18 million per year. So this is a massive problem to the NHS. So how do we currently manage those patients? Well, we try and do things like identify when that catheter is going to block, and we try and preempt that change, so we change the catheter before blockage. So at least that patient has some sort of regime. We obviously encourage the patients to increase their fluid intake. And we use, uh, we use catheter care pair pathways to try and capture all our actions to see that we're trying to give the best possible treatment for that patient. The other thing we can do is we can use ca um, catheter maintenance solutions. And they've been developed to reduce the problem of persistently blocked catheters. 
And these can, solutions can help extend the catheter life to a more acceptable period. But I think this point at the end is really significant. And it was done by um, the New Devon CCG formularists. It's taken from them. They say, however regular bladder in irrigation interrupts the closed drainage system and should only be undertaken if the risk of obstruction is greater than the risk of infection associated with interrupting the closed system. And what is even more, you know, what, what this links to is that there are actually no conclusive studies that determine the effectiveness of bladder maintenance solutions. And they are very expensive. And, you know, the, the costs are up there. But some of these patients that I've come across are having these catheter maintenance solutions on a daily basis in some of these, these worst scenarios. And according to PCA data, this prescription data, in 2015, nearly £7 million were spent on prescribing those, these systems. So I'll just take time to recap with some of the, the key points from what I've just spoken about. 450,000 people in the UK will have a catheter in um, at some point, um, at one time. 50% of those will experience catheter incrustation and blockage. We've identified that Proteus mirabilis is the main bacteria causing incrustation and blockage. We know if the blockage is not detected and the catheter is not changed, then there are serious issues for the patient. And the cost to the NHS due to unplanned admission because of catheter blockage due to incrustation is estimated at 18 million pounds. So now we take the time to look at what Farco Field Protect is. So what is this product and how can it make a difference to your patients? Well, it's a sterile solution for the inflation of the indwelling catheter balloon. It contains 0.3% of the antimicrobial agent triclosan. And we know because of previous research that triclosan is very effective against Proteus mirabilis. Back over the 70s, 80s and 90s, Dr. David Stickler did a, a an enormous amount of research into this. And it's available in syringes of 10 mil. The solution, and therefore the catheter, is changed every four weeks. And we can use this solution, both suprapubic and urethral catheters. And it's already out there for you to be able to use, and it's on prescription. Because it's got the triclosan in, it can reduce encrustation caused by urease-producing bacteria. And it is effective against that biggest one that we know is the trouble causer, which is Proteus mirabilis. So Farcofil will work against that because we know triclosan is effective with the um, Proteus mirabilis. It's also effective of the, the second one there, but it's not effective on the last one. But what we need to just recap on here is that Proteus mirabilis is by far the greatest one that causes catheter incrustation. It's not going to solve the whole issue of, um, of block catheters. This picture here, for instance, shows a catheter blocked by a blood clot. Farcofil will not be of any assistance in this circumstance. How we administer Farcofil Protect is really, really simple, and I'm not even going to take you through these steps. Anybody that's um, done catheterization before, it's just the same as you would put the sterile water in. So this system is completely the same. You've got a syringe and it just goes into the catheter balloon. And when we looked at our um, pre-launch evaluations, 100% of healthcare workers said it was really easy to use because it's not actually changing the procedure as such. But the benefits from using Farco Field Protect are really immense, as you can imagine. Healthcare, ben healthcare professionals benefit from more time to concentrate on other patients because they have fewer catheter changes to do. And you talk to any district nurse, and this is a big um, part of their caseload. There are cost savings, which we know is always important, as fewer devices and less nursing time is required. There are reduced call-outs and emergency admissions, as the catheters are just not blocking. And really importantly, there's an improved quality of life for their patients. And that is something that I've certainly had experience of nurses saying to me, they can't believe how this product has improved the patient's quality of life. Patients um, using Farcofil, well, obviously they're going to benefit from longer in situ time. So that's great for them because they don't want this catheter changed. And some of these patients are having their catheters changed on a 
daily in some, some circumstances, um, certainly the most severe cases. And Sharon's going to take you through some case studies as we move on. They also um, suffer less from, reduced, less from painful catheter changes because, as we said, we've seen the picture of the calcium and some of you have seen catheters that you've pulled out of patients with the calcium and the encrustation on it. And this is really painful to pull out. Um, so with eradicating that, it obviously makes it a much more comfortable procedure. There are also decreased emergency call-outs for them to have to do and admissions for blocked catheters. Most patients don't want to go into hospital and these patients are so concerned that their catheters are blocking and just don't know when that's going to happen. So it really rules their lives. So it gives them the confidence to enjoy their life without the worry of blockage. It's really, this Parker Field Protect is, is aimed at known blockers. So your patients out there that block, and we know that they're blocking due to incrustation. So this is the, this is the product for them. So just to recap again, just on this one, it's a sterile solution for the inflation of indwelling catheter balloons. 0.3% triclosan, a broad spectrum antimicrobial. So that's what's in the solution and that's what you put in the catheter balloon. It can reduce incrustation and blockage in patients suffering, suffering from urease producing bacteria, particularly those Proteus mirabilis, which we know are the most, are the most um, common. It's available in pre-filled syringes, so it's, it's very familiar and easy to use. Use it up to four weeks and it's there already on prescription. So I would just like the time, finally, just to look at the, some of the clinic, clinical evaluations that we did prior to the launch of this product in the UK. What we found was we were able to extend the catheter in situ time for the patients by an average of 10 days. So we took them from 14 days to 24 days. But what was remarkable about, remarkable, remarkable about this, I think I might have got biofilm, <laughs> is that we eliminated the need for catheter maintenance solutions. So they were getting longer in situ catheter wear time without the need to break that system. So we know every time we break the closed system, we have the risk of increased infection. So we were able to leave the catheter in from A to B without any interference in between. And this is amazing, because I say some of these patients, and certainly some of the patients that I came across when doing these evaluations, were having daily um, visits from their district nurse to put in a catheter maintenance solution. So we kept their catheters in longer, and we didn't need to intervene. So this was great. And what a good quality of life for a patient to not have to have that intervention, to know that they're going to go from A to B, and they're not going to block and um, it's all set out. They've not got to worry about anything. They've not got to stay in because the district nurse might come, you know, and I've got this and that. So it's such a good a quality of life improvement for the patients. And of course, with that, it becomes a reduction in costs. Potential savings of around about £530 per patient can be made. But that's on product alone. So we're benefiting the patient, we're benefiting the clinician, and we're also benefiting the NHS and able to save them money. So the results, well, 70% of the evaluators demonstrated significant savings to the NHS on prescription products alone. 70% of the patients required fewer catheter changes. And as I say, very importantly, all did not require the use of expensive catheter maintenance solutions. What we also found is with the use of Farcofil Protect, large savings could be gained in associated nursing time costs, out of hours treatments, emergency admissions, antibiotics, and treatment for urinary tract infections, all of which is very costly. So what I'm now going to do for you is pass you over to Sharon. And Sharon's going to have a little look at um, Farcofil in practice and let you have, a, um, I think I'm going to take us through some case studies as well. So I'll pass you over to Jack. Sharon, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, I'm up here because I just love <laughs> talking about bladders and bowels. I'm a specialist nurse. I work in the least sexy area of the NHS. Um, people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to know about it. But every single person we come across potentially could need a catheter at some stage. And I spend a phenomenal part of my time with my community colleagues trying to unpick these complicated patients that cause issues. 
You've seen some of the cost savings that are very easy to, to discuss from a product perspective. What we can never quantify is the quality of life issues that it affects the patients and the time spent from a nursing perspective. <laughs> Why would I get involved in something like this? And I was very lucky to be asked a few years ago to, to give my opinion on this. I want to make a difference in what I do every day. I want the nursing staff and the people that I work with to have an easier time of it. Because when you're getting called out the third or fourth time a day to see some of these patients and there's just no option for you of how to solve the problem, we need something to change. I'm not somebody who will stand here and say one size fits all. Um, but I am prepared to try different things to see whether we can improve the workplace and the, the exp experience of all the patients themselves. Catheter blockage and bypassing are phenomenally um, common problems. We know that. We know that it's most likely caused by incrustation. When I started nursing, you learnt to catheterise pretty much on day one. See one, do one, teach one. That's how we did it, because we stuck catheters in everybody. If you moved, if you breathed, you got a catheter in a hospital setting. And that was it. And we've got patients still to this day who have got catheters in from those times that probably don't need them. Over a million indwelling catheters used in the NHS every single year, and at least a quarter we know are unnecessary. We're seeing an increase in sepsis and we're seeing an increase in UTIs associated with catheters. In my trust, we had a sepsis death that was associated with the use of um, frequent catheter maintenance solutions. We were breaking that closed drainage system. We didn't have a good reason for doing it in the eyes of the investigation. And somebody died from this, so it can't get any stronger than that. There are a small cohort of patients who we cannot manage without catheters. We know that. We know that they ha that's their only option that they've got. We know with these catheters, there's masses of research out there. You only have to look coming out of the Bristol Urological Institute over decades. We, we've got the knowledge of what's going wrong. We get an increased negative pressure. It's almost like having a vacuum cleaner sucking out the contents of your bladder if you've got a catheter on free drainage. And you walk around any hospital trust or any healthcare organisation, there's patients now stood outside because that's where they've got to go to smoke, with the catheter bags just swinging free, not supported. You go out in community, anybody that's worked out in a community area, you see everything that shouldn't happen. We know that. There is a 30 centimetre rule when it comes to catheters. Um, the further away the drainage bag is from the bladder itself, if it's more than 30 centimetres, it increases the potential for these problems but we always put catheter bags as far away as we can. We put them down low on the leg because that's how they fit discreetly under our clothing. That's what we would choose to wear. And unfortunately, we've come into a, a culture now of blocked catheter, reach straight for a washout. I was a urology nurse and we used to get the big 50 mil syringes and we used to push it in at pressure and we used to pull back at pressure. We still do that in certain situations, but it should be minimal and it should be very closely monitored how you would do that. We know that antibiotics and antiseptics don't have any, any impact or very little impact on encrustation. And we know that what we're doing by breaking that seal and introducing foreign bodies into there, we are greatly increasing the risk to the patient. And I'm living proof that in my trust we've had a sepsis death that we've had to account for. We can't bring that person back. We can't change that practice that's already happened. But we can consider for the future how to make it better. Anyone that's ever worked with patients with catheters, they're probably one of the biggest challenges we face. They're not nice. Anyone in the room had a catheter? It's not kind of on your bucket list to have, is it? They're not pleasant, they're not comfortable. You're perceived to be older than you are, you're perceived to be smelly. And then, oh, I'm a problem patient because I'm having to call somebody every five minutes. And literally some of these patients are on the phone several times in a day. We were asked a few years ago to consider doing some work around this area um, and we were asked to try with some of our problematic patients thinking about using something like Farcofil Protect. So this is just some of the patients that we approached and we engaged with to see whether we can make a difference. So we've got this gentleman who's 51, he's got complex health needs. You will notice a theme going through all the case studies. These are all complex patients. They are not your standard in-out catheters in for a short period of time. This gentleman's got an acquired brain injury resulting in epilepsy and a neurogenic bladder. He's also got significant behavioural problems. He doesn't react very well to new faces and lots of interventions from clinical staff. He's got a superpubic um, catheter because it's the, deemed the least risky from a, a urethral catheter and it's blocking <coughs> frequently, getting several changes of catheters. The longest he used to go was about three days before he needed a catheter change. 
Every time the catheter was removed, it was literally put your foot on the bed, wind the catheter around your hand and pull out because it was so encrusted and so stuck to his anatomy. And it was visible. We could see this. Years ago, we used to cut the tips of catheters, send them away for, for lab examination. We didn't need to with him. You, it was there in front of your eyes. It was extremely painful for him. It was traumatic. His family weren't overly um, happy with the, the way things went. And it was very difficult for the staff. And certainly anyone that's worked in community, you're often out there on your own. So you've no one to back you up. You've no one else to give you a bit of moral support. We tried different types of catheters with this guy. We tried different types of material, different tips to see if that made any difference. And he had bladder washouts, catheter maintenance solutions. Nothing seemed to make any significant changes. Right at the end of the scenario, we decided to try inflating the balloon of the catheter. We were on an open tip catheter at this point, using the Farcafil Protect. Now, in the UK, catheters can stay in for up to 12 weeks. If we're going to use Farcafil Protect, it's licensed for four weeks' use. That's because lots of the research comes from uh, mainland continent, mainland Europe, and that's how they manage their catheters. Actually, if I can get somebody to a four-week catheter change instead of three or four times a week, I've won in some ways. I've gained something. Within a couple of weeks of using this, we found that it feel, felt more comfortable for this gentleman. He was able to verbalise this to us. He was a lot more content when we were doing anything with his catheter, any interventions. And coincidentally, because at the time we didn't realise this would happen, the more we used the Farcafil Protect every time we did a catheter change, the least, less evidence of blockage and encrustation. It seemed to clean up the bladder. We were worried if there would be any sort of toxicity from this because, as all of you will know, that um, a deal with catheters, when you inflate a balloon in a catheter and it stays in for any period of time, you lose some of the dimensions of what you've inflated. It's natural chemistry how that happens. But because the bladder is empty and filling on a regular basis as you empty the drainage bag, any of the triclosan that would leak out into the bladder, which is how it works and how it cleans it up, didn't cause us any toxic problems. We had no adverse reactions whatsoever. Very, very quickly with this guy, we got him up to a four-week catheter change, which felt like an absolute miracle. And certainly for his family, it was a lot easier. They could plan things. They didn't have to wait in for healthcare professionals. The district nursing caseload certainly improved from this. His symptoms of pain and discomfort seemed to disappear the longer we used it. And he's much happier in what we do. And this was several years ago that we started this. He's still on his four-week schedule of change. He's still happy with that. And we see very, very few problems with this gentleman from a catheter perspective. Our next gentleman, 67-year-old with multiple sclerosis. We seem to have an increase of multiple sclerosis across the UK. We seem to be seeing more and more of these people through our specialisms with bladder problems. This gentleman's got a long-term indwelling urethral catheter. There's no other way of managing. We've tried everything else, including intermittent catheterization, and it's what suits his needs the best at this moment in time. And similar to the last gentleman, we've got frequent call-outs, out-of-hours call-outs, encrustation, bypassing of urine, at least once or twice in every week. Again, we go down the usual route of let's try changing the catheter. One size doesn't fit all. Maybe it's a different material. Maybe it's a different tip that we need to use. And for this gentleman, somebody had established regular bladder washouts using both saline and citric acid solutions. It's not a great plan to be putting something that's very astringent into a bladder that's already problematic and possibly inflamed. He's eating and drinking normally. We always check that as a standard with these patients. And... You can't do anything with bladder without considering bowel, so we've checked that his bowel function is normal. We introduced Farcafil Protect on one of his catheter changes, and with him, we got the win straight away. He went a full four weeks with no problems, no bypassing, no reports of discomfort, no SOS call-outs to his out-of-hours services. So we've continued to use it on him with his permission, and there appears to be, appears to be an accumulative effect again. It's starting to clean up his bladder. We're seeing less and less of the, the encrustation and the evidence of problems with him. This lady, a little bit younger than the other two, um, with a long-term respiratory problem, several long-term conditions, making her again a complex case. She's got a long-term urethral catheter in to manage her bladder. She's got intractable incontinence and is at risk of skin integrity issues if we don't manage it in this way. And all of her catheter blockages that have repeatedly happened day after day have not responded positively to any other intervention, the usual of changing the, the, the catheter materials and things. She's again another one that went down route one of catheter washouts, catheter maintenance solutions. They do have a place, 
but they are high risk and they are recognised as high risk, so they should be at the end of the chain of what you try um, and maybe something else will have a better effect. We brought in Facfil Protect for Her in January 2016. This is before it came to um, formulary. And again, straight away, people reported an instant improvement with this lady. She's now on that four-week catheter change. We could take it off licence and push it further, but that's got its own restrictions on, on practice. So we're just hoping that the original researchers will go back and do more research so that it will fit the UK market and go to a 12-week. Because I firmly believe in some of these complex cases, we could get them to 12-week catheter changes. There's no evidence or little evidence of debris or encrustation again. It's started to clean up that bladder and get rid of the problems. And all of these patients consistently have said the actual physical change of the catheter has become much more comfortable. It's less traumatic. I'm now more confident in what you're doing. The nursing staff are more confident. They're not sort of drawing straws as to who's going to go and see that problematic patient now. And to date, and this was from 2016, we haven't needed to use any form of bladder washout, installation, catheter maintenance solution on her because we've been able to maintain her with alternative means. Another one of our complex patients, they're all very similar in the fact that they have complex health needs. They have no other way of managing bladder drainage without an indwelling catheter, either urethral or suprapubic. They want to live a reasonably normal life in their own homes, supported by family, with minimal intervention from healthcare. But they've all had problematic catheters where we've been going in on a very regular basis. This gentleman has no natural bladder function and needs a urethral catheter. He can't have a suprapubic for various reasons. And we've tried all sorts. We've tried the valve system to get rid of the 30 centimetre bag rule to allow the bladder to fill and empty itself through a catheter valve, which is a normal functioning bladder, or as normal as we can get it when we've got to use catheters. Nothing changed, nothing made any difference, and it just got worse and worse for this guy. Introduced Fagfil Protect into inflating the balloon, and it was exactly the same as all the others. I have to say, as a clinician, it completely astounded me because I've never seen anything work in the way it is. We all get people coming to see us, selling us the latest product. It's the best thing since sliced bread. Everything's going to change and it's going to solve all your problems. And if you're anything like me, you're a little bit cynical because nothing works quite the way it says on the tin. But actually, this one did. So I have to eat my words for that. Again, this guy's on a four-week catheter change. We're several years on now from introducing this and he's had a much better quality of life around his catheter care. All of these patients are complex, so it's a niche market, it's a niche area of healthcare that we're looking at. But we're seeing across our district, and I cover two acute hospitals as well as a community area, such a diverse mix of people delivering health and social care. It's not necessarily your registered professionals anymore that are doing this. It's lots of different grades of staff. And they need to have the tools to be able to deliver the care effectively and make the patients as comfortable as possible. Anything to do with the catheter can be painful, can be uncomfortable, can be distressing. We can't quantify how much time we spend and what it costs to send out several members of staff over several visits or several contacts. And we can't quantify how much it costs other than a patient inpatient stay on, on, on a, a daytime cost of, of a bed in, in a hospital. Most of our patients in our area that we decided to try this on were in receipt of regular bladder washouts, catheter maintenance solutions. And my question would always be, if you're giving that regularly, but you've still got the problem, why are you still doing it? Because it's clearly not making any positive difference or change. Every single time we break that seal to give the catheter maintenance solution or the bladder washout or the syringe with 50 mils of saline, whichever version you're using, we're putting that patient at risk. And we can't put them at any more risk than when you get a sepsis death and you've got to uncover the, the, the um, interventions that we tried. So our out-of-hours services were backwards and forwards. Now, my, my community area in Calderdale, anyone seen Last of the Summer Wine? It's kind of that area. It's all Happy Valley, if you've watched that. It's very rural, and it can take you two hours to get from one end of the district to the other on little tiny roads that really aren't fit for anything more than a horse and cart. So you can see the impact it's going to have on services. Now, any of you that are London-based, you've got your similar, similar problems and restrictions, but for different reasons, because you're so compacted together, you actually just can't move because there's so many of you. Some of these patients ended up with unplanned admissions to hospital. And if they were out in Todmorden, that meant potentially a two-hour journey to the nearest acute hospital in their patch. 
because of the ge geography of the area. Anyone who's ever been into an acute hospital in through A&E services, God help anyone that works in A&E, you have to sit there, you have to wait your turn, and you have to get bumped down the line when emergencies come in. So some of our catheter patients were sitting six, seven, eight hours waiting to be resolved, waiting to be reviewed by a urologist. And it's no different wherever you go in the country. We've all got these pressures. If we can avoid these patients having to go into hospitals in that way, if we can avoid filling up A&E beds and, and spaces with these kind of patients by just one simple change in practice, surely it's going to improve everything for everybody. We can decrease our workload for our staff if we get it right, instead of following route one of what we're comfortable with and what we've done for decades. Anything about a catheter creates negativity. It's uncomfortable, it's not a pleasant thing to have, and we certainly do have a culture of, oh God, who's gonna go see that patient today? What else can we do? And we literally do have teams who are trying to avoid getting involved in the care of some of these because they're just too difficult to manage. It doesn't project very well, so I'm hoping that you get access to these afterwards. If not, drop me an email and we will send you this. Because we'd seen such good results in our area, when we redid our catheterisation policy, we came up with a flow chart. Just a quick reminder, a guidance at a glance is what we call it. Stole the name off somebody else, so apologies. Just to say, I've got a blocked catheter. What should I look at first? What should I think about rather than just going for route one, syringe or catheter maintenance solution? We're really, really pleased because this is now going in the RCN catheter guideline review, which is due out at the end of this month, as a template to say, consider it. We don't know everything, we don't have the right answer to everything, but maybe we need to work through some of these simpler solutions before we reach for the risky ones. And I say apologies, it's not really projecting very well, but drop me an email, you can have it if you're really interested. So in conclusion for us, introducing something like Farcofil Protect into this complex group of patients has extended the life of the catheter. It's a win-win for everybody. We've got an acceptable schedule for change. And just because a catheter can last 12 weeks doesn't mean to say it should. And some of our patients are on very specific schedules of change determined by their clinical presentation. I've got one lady who, if you leave her more than seven days, she goes septic. If you change her at five days she's okay. So we have got these highly unusual patients out there. We need to think outside of the box for them. All of the patients involved when we did this trial, and we've continued using it since it's come to formulary, have without fail reported a reduction in the discomfort when they've had their catheters changed, because it's not pleasant. They almost have to grit their teeth and get on with it, but it's very painful for them. So anything that improves that, in my opinion, is going to be worth trying. We have negated or significantly reduced the need for use of unnecessary use of um, bladder washouts and catheter maintenance solutions, which from a CCG point of view, they're delighted because we saved the money. From my point of view, we're seeing a reduction in the sepsis associated um, with these maintenance solutions and the breaking of the, the closed drainage system. What I would say is everyone's individual. We're not robots, everybody's different, we all react differently. And it's just about clinicians taking time out to say what is available, what could I consider. And some of the things in our guidance at a glance you'll consider and dismiss straight away because you've already been there, you've already tried that. So every patient needs an individualised clinical assessment and treatment plan and it doesn't take very long to work through a flowchart of that type. We need to maintain effective blood drainage and management. We need to protect skin integrity, but we also need to reduce those cortis that are occurring. Short-term catheters don't necessarily see the same level of issues with encrustation, but in some of these <coughs> complex groups, we do see it even in a short-term catheter. So in my opinion, as a clinician working in the least exciting area of the NHS, that's not my opinion that it's least exciting, obviously. These are complex patients with problematic catheters, but it's made a difference. And for me, that's what I get up every day for and go to work for. Thank you for listening. And I think we've got time for questions if anybody's got any. Because, yeah.